Welcome to Fed Tax 101. Today, we will conclude our two part discussion of the federal tax rules that apply to companies engaged in international commerce. In part one, we discussed the Internal Revenue Code's general framework for taxing cross border transactions. Part two provides a brief introduction to four additional concepts layered on top of this basic foundation in 2017. Recall that we said in Part 1 that the U.S. follows a worldwide system of taxation for U.S.-based multinationals, but that most of our global trading partners follow a territorial system. We discussed how large U.S. corporations felt they were at a competitive disadvantage globally by having to pay the higher U.S. corporate tax rate on their entire worldwide income. In response, some companies structured their global organizations in a way that kept their foreign source income offshore and out of the reach of the IRS for as long as the U.S. parent wanted to. We also discussed how some U.S. companies were going so far as moving their global headquarters to other countries in order to avoid having to pay the U.S.'s higher corporate tax rate on their entire worldwide income. In 2017, Congress made a number of changes to the international tax rules in addition to reducing the corporate tax rate, in part to address these concerns. Let's briefly touch on four of the most important to help complete the big picture overview of this topic. First, certain domestic corporations might now be able to effectively bring income earned through foreign corporations back to the U.S. tax-free. The ability to repatriate foreign earnings without paying U.S. tax is accomplished through a 100% dividends received deduction, or DRD. The 100% DRD is intended to offset taxable income that results from receiving a dividend from the U.S. corporation's foreign businesses. The domestic company is still taxed on that dividend, as we discussed before, but now it may be able to neutralize the tax impact to the extent this deduction is available. Significantly, the 100% DRD places the U.S. on sort of a hybrid territorial system. The U.S. effectively uses a territorial system for qualifying foreign source dividends, but any other foreign source income, such as income earned through a foreign branch or partnership, for example, remains subject to the basic worldwide system we discussed in Part 1, and so continue to be taxed at the U.S. tax rate without any offset. Next up is the Base Erosion and Anti-Abuse Tax, or BEAT. Recall from Episode 1 that the government was becoming concerned that U.S. companies were structuring their global organizations in ways that reduced their U.S. tax liability. BEAT was one of Congress's attempts to plug what it saw as a leak in the dam. A U.S. company making large payments to related foreign companies in low-tax jurisdictions and then deducting those huge payments in computing its U.S. tax liability. For example, a U.S. company might have an Irish subsidiary own all of the intellectual property like patents on the formulas or processes used in the U.S. parent's manufacturing operations or the company's trademarks or trade names. The U.S. parent then makes a large royalty payment to the Irish subsidiary every year for the parent's use of that IP and deducts that royalty payment on its U.S. tax return. Because the related foreign company would pay tax on its royalty income at Ireland's lower tax rate, the overall global enterprise effectively shifts taxable income from the U.S. to Ireland, reducing its high-taxed U.S. income in exchange for increasing its low-taxed Irish income, with little or no impact on its business operations. The U.S. government saw this as eroding our own tax base. BEAT was an effort to remove the U.S. tax benefit from these sorts of transactions. Simplistically, BEAT is an additional tax 
that applies to very large U.S. corporations that make sufficiently large deductible payments to related foreign companies. The new rules don't deny the U.S. company a deduction for those payments. You can still deduct that huge payment to your foreign subsidiary. But by imposing an additional tax on the U.S. company for making that payment, BEAT tries to protect the U.S. tax base by taking away the economic incentive from these sorts of arrangements. Third, the Foreign Derived Intangible Income Provision, FIDI, or the day, provides a tax benefit for U.S. corporations that sell certain types of goods and services to customers or for use outside the United States. Export subsidies generally are not permitted under international trade agreements, so we won't call it that. But FIDI basically applies a lower tax rate to certain types of income a domestic corporation earns from selling goods or providing services to qualifying customers outside the United States. Treasury and the IRS have issued detailed regulations governing how you determine if you've sold the right type of goods or provided the right type of service to the right type of customer in the right kind of place. As demonstrated by the hundreds of pages of regulations, it took the IRS to explain these rules. The ability to claim the lower FIDI tax rate for income earned from foreign sales and services is a lot more difficult than it sounds. For qualifying income, though, FIDI can provide a significant tax savings for domestic corporations. Finally, the Global Intangible Low-Taxed Income Provision guilty, essentially imposes a minimum tax on a U.S. company's worldwide income. Simplistically, guilty imposes an additional tax on certain U.S. shareholders based on their worldwide income earned through CFCs, regardless of whether or when that foreign source income is returned to the U.S. as a dividend. Guilty basically tries to prevent large U.S. companies from keeping foreign source earnings outside the reach of the IRS by keeping it offshore in a CFC indefinitely. Congress also saw guilty as a way of making the U.S. parent tax indifferent as to whether the CFC's earnings should be invested abroad or instead paid immediately to the U.S. parent as a dividend and reinvested here. Because of guilty, and the new 100% DRD, the tax cost to the parent should be roughly the same either way. So where and how to invest the foreign earnings becomes an operational decision rather than one driven at least in part by tax planning. A key thing to know about guilty is its interaction with FIDI. Remember we said FIDI is a tax break for income earned from your operations inside the U.S., a carrot, and that guilty is an additional tax on certain amounts earned by your CFCs outside the United States, a stick. Well, the equations used to compute your FIDI and to compute your guilty intersect by using some of the same definitions, but the tax impact of some of those terms move in opposite directions. As a result, tax planning that increases your FIDI benefit might increase your guilty tax, and tax planning that reduces your guilty tax might reduce your FIDI benefit, depending upon your own particular facts during a given year. Because these are permanent changes in your tax liability, not just timing, carefully modeling out these competing considerations is now more important than ever. How complicated are the 2017 changes to the international tax rules? Well, so far, Treasury and the IRS have issued many hundreds of pages of regulations regarding BEAT, FIDI, GUILTY, and the DRD. And there are still so many complexities and uncertainties on how these rules apply that we can expect many more regulations, revenue rulings, other administrative guidance, and eventually many protracted disputes with the IRS on audit and probably many years of litigation. The international tax area 
especially the new rules enacted in 2017, is extremely complex and requires a great deal of study. The Blue Book, prepared by Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation to explain the 2017 tax reform legislation, provides an outstanding overview of this area and is a great place to get started. It's available on the JCT's website. Well, that's it for this episode of Tax 101. Keep checking back for more. So long, everyone.